1905 was the height of opium use in world history. Uh, global production of it was 41,000 tons. Okay, today there's about 6,600 tons to 9,000 tons at the most that gets produced. So, in 1898, the United States fights a war with Spain, and we acquire Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. We also inherited a legal opium monopoly from the Spanish colonial government that was operating in the Philippines. Um, at the same time, there's this huge global movement going on for prohibition, led by the Protestant churches, um, the Anglican Protestant churches. These people don't have any fun ever, and they try to stop mm -hmm. out everybody else's fun where mm -hmm. they go. And uh, so they led the prohibition movement. Because of political pressure, the very first federal laws geared towards any type of prohibition of drug use was for the Philippines. Um, it outlawed opium use, it made all addicts register, and they all got compulsory treatment. Uh, in response to opium smuggling, the U.S. convened the, first, the world's first like drug conference in Shanghai in 1909, and from that point, the world was kind of on a path to prohibition. Um, then, two things happened around the same time. In 1914, the U.S. passed what's known as the Grandmother of All Drug Laws, the Harrison Tax, Narcotics Act, and this made all opiates and all um, mind-altering substances for the day, uh, illegal cocaine, um, heroin. The trade moved from the legal monopolies, custom houses, in underground into crime syndicates. So you also had this huge rise of organized crime that you've never had before at this time. So then when they made, uh, when they passed the Volstead Act and they made alcohol illegal, you had all of the vices controlled by the criminal underworld, right? And they had a monopoly on it. So you had this huge spike in crime and violence in America that we had never really had before. Um, these criminal networks then would go on and they would spread all over the world wherever you would find precursors to these substances, right? So also what ends up happening in the around this time is that government intervention into the drug trade starts to begin. And the Treasury Department, which is an interesting choice for this if you think about it, the Treasury Department is the first ones that were put in charge of enforcing prohibition laws. They had a prohibition unit that was split into two groups, the alcohol unit and the drug unit, okay? Um, when alcohol was, uh, prohibition was repealed, um, the drug unit became the only one left. It became known as the Bureau of Narcotics, and then it was spun off into its own agency, the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, and then later it would morph into the DEA. Um, before World War II, The Bureau of Narcotics, right, was the only government agency um, that was trained in any type of covert investigative tactics. Everything that we take for granted today in the police force didn't exist before World War II. Um, the only groups that were doing covert investigations of any kind was the Bureau of Narcotics. And they were mostly keeping eyes on monsters, who were the ones that mainly ran most of the so um, they were the first kind of intelligence agents. And as the war kicked off in the 40s, the government pulled many of these Bureau of Narcotics agents in to become intelligence operatives. Um, this knowledge of covert action, along with this familiarity with drug trafficking mobsters, led to a marriage and a merging that would prove to be one of the biggest foreign policy decisions ever done as a country. And um, this is when the drug trade and our actual stated foreign policy started to become intertwined. And this leads us to um, the first part of problem, reaction, solution, paradigm history, which is talking about how the drug war serves our foreign policy and geostrategic alliances. The main source for this section is Peter Dale Scott, Drugs, Oil, and War, and Cocaine Politics. Alfred McCoy, as I mentioned earlier. And what's interesting to note is that each intervention that we've had since World War II, particularly, has been primarily orchestrated to secure energy resources, natural resources, oil, rubber, tin, copper, what have you. Um, 
Coincidentally, most of these interventions have also taken place in the three largest drug producing regions in the world, right? Which is the Golden Triangle, which exists in Southeast Asia, the Golden Crescent, which is along the border region of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and then the Andes region of South America. In each of these cases, our CIA allied themselves um, with rebel or guerrilla or insurgent armies um, that were all involved in drug trade. To provide cover for these actions, the US government would practice reverse drug propaganda, and they would blame communists and then terrorists or whoever else was the enemy of the day. They would be the ones that would get blamed for the drug trafficking instead of our allies. Um, and what the CIA had to figure out to do, which the British and the Dutch had all kind of taught them, and the Spanish ahead of time, was um, how to fund into the billions of dollars covert and illegal military operations and um, other assassinations, uh, election rigging, you know, disruptions to um, political parties. Um, how to do this when Congress won't give you money for it and the American people won't go for it and you need to come up with a lot of money fast. So um, while they would publicly invoke, you know, we're fighting the communists, we're fighting the terrorists, go America, behind the scenes they'd be funneling billions of dollars from drugs and arms sales into these proxy armies who would go do our fighting for us when we couldn't afford to lose any soldiers, any American bodies. So here's how the chronology went with all of that. Um, it began during World War II. Um, these Bureau of Narcotics guys were pulled into the intelligence operation there were two groups operating. One was called the Office of Strategic Services, the other was called the Office of Naval Intelligence. They merged later to become the CIA after the war. But they were individual um, agencies before that. They pulled in all these narcotics agents who then hooked them up with all of these monsters. So there was a sit down between our armed forces and Lucky Luciano, who was the head of the Italian and the Sicilian Mafia. And they basically said, look, okay, you guys control the docks and you guys, um, are Sicilians and you don't really get along with Mussolini and uh, we know you don't like the fascists and so we got a proposition for you. Keep an eye on the docks for us, help us go and kick Mussolini's ass and we'll let you guys do whatever you want. So uh, the mafia decided, being strident capitalists and pro-Americans that they are, they decided this is a great idea, uh, let's do this. Um, so they set up a resistance network that was based out of Sicily to help undermine Mussolini's army. Now, after the war, the CIA stayed allied with these guys, and the Sicilians joined the Corsicans, which are French mobsters, um, Greek gangsters, and they got together with uh, former Nazi soldiers, right, and former soldiers for each of these countries, Germany, France, Italy, right, um, to form what was called Gladio. And Gladio was a, a, what was known as a Leave Behind Army. It was a network of these specially trained, uh, autonomously operated, so they were in cells. You know, you hear about terrorist cells. Well, that whole organizational structure was created by NATO in the post-war um, post era. So these Leave Behind Armies were there to essentially um, disrupt the communists any way they could. They would assassinate leaders, they would blow up offices or clubs and blame them on communists. They would they assassinated the former Prime Minister of Italy, Alvin Moro, in 1978. Um, they were known for rigging elections, they were known for causing mayhem everywhere they went. Um, and this was on behalf of NATO, right? Um, they often funded their operations through the CIA and through drug uh, money because it was a way to, again, raise this money to do these operations so that nobody could have a record of it and nobody would know how they were being funded, let alone that they even existed. 